said that he gives you time to rest. And time to rest is a time to rebuild, to rejuvenate ourselves, to regenerate and to rebuild ourselves which have been destroyed during the day. And normally it's our mind, our brains which are hustled most. Of course our muscles, our, our bodies, our chests, our hearts and everything are also hustled. But it's our minds which are hustled mostly. And uh, next slide please. And I just want you to picture your own body. I know rarely do you hear your heart. But this is an organ I listen to every day. Because I'm, in, I'm into the heart. And so the heart goes, pam, 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 pam. And sometimes it goes, pam, 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 pam. Isn't it men when you see a beautiful woman in town? Yeah? I don't know what happens to the women. But when I see a beautiful woman, my heart goes, pam, pam, pam. Of course, I... And then I ask God to help me. And uh, he controls my heart. This is normal. This is normal. If you don't have that kind of reaction, something is wrong with you. You need to come and see me. You need to activate your heart. Otherwise, you'll be going into bloody very soon. So God, in his own mercy, he said the heart must work and it must rest. So it goes, bum, and it rests. Bum, and it rests. And that is inbuilt in us, in our brains. Because we need a time to rest. So that we can rest enough to regenerate our bodies. It is well known now, no doubt whatsoever, that you need seven to eight hours of rest every day. If you sleep less than six hours, six or less, and if you sleep for more than nine hours, it is now known that you have shortened, shortened your life by nine years. So don't oversleep. And don't sleep too little because you've got exams or what have you. Sleep enough. Sleep seven to eight hours. This is good for you. Next slide, please. Now, we also know, I just want to tell you a bit of physiology of sleeping. I'll come back to, to, to the proper thing, but early bed, if you go bed to, early to bed, and you rise early, around 4 o'clock, 4.30, 5 o'clock. We know that this gentleman has said, you will make a healthy man, a wealthy man, and a wise man. And of course, you can have, make a healthy woman, a wealthy woman, and a wise woman too. So, you need to go to bed early. Now, you're going to ask me, how early is early? When you feel tired, that's early enough. Go to bed. Next slide, please. We also know that, you know, as I've just mentioned to you, the hustles of Harare today are hustling every port. Especially those who are involved in salary gate, or those who are involved in all sorts of things. Uh, business, everything, even patients also, even doctors, also, we are also strained and stressed. And we know that we need to slow down. You should not let the way, world pace you. You should pace the world. Don't let the world pace you. Let your heart and your brain pace it. Next slide, please. Now, I've just put here, every one of us is stressed at one point or the other. Now, stress is good for us. But there are certain types of stress which are not good. Unfortunately, stress affects us from head to toe. In the brain, it causes depression, anxiety, insomnia. So many people are not sleeping. Whether because they've got financial problems, they've got marital problems, which we are going to hear tonight. There are so many things which cause us to have problems. In the neck, it affects the muscles, it affects the joints. In the chest, it affects the heart, it affects the lungs. In the tummy, it affects our stomach, it affects our joints, it affects everything. Unfortunately, it also even affects the reproductive organs of a human being. And you find men, it is one of the commonest causes of impotence. Do you know what is impotence? Inability to have erection, to have intimacy with your wife. Are you with me? Did you hear? So don't stress yourself at work. You need to distress yourself. And as I, the next one, next slide please. You see, I want to speak to the ladies that a good bedroom like this one will distress your husband. When he comes in here, he knows he's going to have a good sleep. Already, 
hormones are being secreted in his body to getting ready to get to sleep. We know very well. I'll tell you about those hormones very, very soon. Next one. And this is the kind of sleep which is wanted. I rarely have it like this. <laughs> but once in a while, I get a good hug and I, I'm hugged when I'm sleeping. But in most cases, it is like this. This is a disaster. It's a disaster. I'm sure the family life man is going to tell us more about these disasters which happen in the bedrooms. This is a disaster. Because you know you need certain hormones for you to sleep well. I'm going to talk to you about it. One of the most important hormones is called oxytocin. You know, when we were doing medicine when I was young, I used to think that oxytocin is only secreted in women when they're giving birth. Actually, it's secreted more in men. Do you know that this is the hormone of happiness? Did you know that? This is the hormone of happiness, which is secreted, secreted in large amounts after intimacy with your partner, with your spouse. It is secreted. It makes your body relaxed. Your brain forgets everything, and you sleep well. Six, seven to eight hours. And we also know, we also know that there is a hormone called ghrelin. There's also a hormone called leptin. Down a bit. There is ghrelin. This ghrelin hormone is the one actually very secreted very early in the evening, even before you never suffer. We now know that this ghrelin is the one which actually stimulates hunger and actually increases appetite. And it is the one causing a lot of obesity. Well, we know leptin does the opposite. And this is why we promote everywhere. World Health Organization says your breakfast must be the biggest meal. Your lunch somehow small. Supper must be the smallest because you will then become very fat. And if you tell on BMI, it will be more than 30. And that's not good for you. And we also know that grilling is involved in the carbohydrate and in the uh, uh, lipid metabolism. It's also involved in our immune function. So all that is secreted and causing uh, a lot of increased appetite. As long as you don't eat the food, it has got other good functions. And that is to strengthen your immune, uh, your immunity and uh, your heart function. Now we also know that there is a hormone called growth hormone. This hormone is secreted in every one of us and is secreted in houses. And it is there to repair the broken cells which have taken place during the day. And uh, the greatest pass or the greatest secretion takes place in the early evening. Next one, please. Um, and I just want to, to tell you that, again, a growth hormone is very, very important. And it's, as I just mentioned, that it's secreted during the early part of the evening. But not only that, it is secreted when someone is massaged. And I've got a, build, a picture there. You see a nice wife who's very lucky, who's got a nice husband who is massaging her feet. And this will encourage the secretion of growth hormone. So ladies, when you get home, ask your husband, sit in the chair, read the newspapers, and put your leg there and say, can you massage my legs, please? They will do it, and you will sleep better. And you can see also that sleep uh, can be, uh, there's a hormone called melatonin. Melatonin is very, very important for our sleep, because it is a hormone which is essentially secreted when we are asleep. And for those who sleep very late after 12 midnight, they will miss it because it's secreted around 11 o'clock, around 12 o'clock. So go to bed before 11 o'clock. And you can see even refugees, even students, even those accountants who just know themselves, they need to take a rest so that melatonin is secreted. <laughs> and we also know that, don't rush, just hang on, we also know that um, uh, melatonin is an antioxidant. And antioxidant is very, very important for us because it protects our blood vessels from those uh, oxidants which want to damage our blood vessels. And so you protect your heart, you protect your blood vessels because you've got melatonin which is being secreted. There are also radicals which are secreted whenever there is uh, metabolism in our bodies. There are radicals which are secreted. That's the function of melatonin. And God gave us this melatonin because he knew there would be such things like that. And it comes in the right time when we go to sleep. I just want to show you a few stages of sleep which are very, very important. Uh, the first stage of sleep is the light one which you can easily be awoken. And stage two and three, these are uh, uh, stage two is when you've got a sleep and you've got eye movements 
and uh, the brain waves become slower. It, you, your brain is not very active. And then we go to stage three, uh, stage four. I'm just going to combine these two because this is the time when you are in deep sleep. Even if you are walking up by your husband like this, you don't want to wake up at all. What is the problem? But you know that's when the husband's going to wake up. I know that very well because I'm also a husband. Now, <laughs> stage five. <laughs> Remember also stage three and four is when you have got you can actually walk around very very you know, in the house, not even knowing. You can even have bed waiting. You know you can pass urine in the bed. Not knowing that you're passing you, you think you're in the toilet and you're passing you and you don't care during this time. And for those, even those who are always, people who have been found naked, it's not because they are always or they are witch, or, or witch doctors or whatever you, they are just sleepwalking because they are naked. They are just sleepwalking outside and you can sleepwalk, come back into your bedroom and you never know it. You will never know it. And so if you are seen by a policeman and you think that you are, you are a witch doctor or something, this is normal. And it occurs in stage three and stage four. Stage five is a very common one. And after this one, you get very uh, a lot of eye checks. Your eyes are moving like this. And if you want, if you wake up, you watch your wife around 11 o'clock, you see her moving her eyes like this. And at that time, I think most of you have said to yourselves, my legs are paralyzed. I couldn't wake up, but I was awake. I could wake up, but my hands could move. They are just this normal. This is the time they are paralyzed. And the legs are also paralyzed. It's very, very normal. Next slide, please. Uh, this next slide, please. Just to summarize. Now, whenever you have a headache, whenever you have got a back pain, when you've got things, you're not sleeping well, it's worthwhile to think about taking a vacation. A vacation is very, very important. This was for us black people. We don't like taking a holiday. We think we're wasting a lot of money. Take a vacation. Go somewhere and do something. Get a ride. Take your children. Go and your children have a play ball, whatever it is. Go go with them. Go to South Africa, to Big Falls, to Nyanga, whatever it is. Go away from our Take a vacation with your family. Next one, please. Now, recreation is very, very important. It's a form of inducing good rest. It is, it is a way of resting, actually. There are many people who go play golf on Sundays. There are people who go swimming. There are people who go boating and fishing. These are all ways of, of, of taking rest. Recreation. Are you with me? I just want to acknowledge the... Um, uh, he's no more actually general, but he's a higher post. I can't know what it's called. But um, yeah, welcome. He's my brother, actually. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Take a rest and by and a recreation also. Now, God also, in his own mercy, I'll take you back to the time of creation. And when he has finished creating six days, he was creating all animals, vegeta vegetation, and everything. He had created a human being. And he took, the Bible says in Genesis 1, verse 31, he took, he had created in front everything very, very beautiful. And on Genesis 2, verse 1 to 2, he says, he then blessed the seventh day. He rested on that day. Now, you may argue and say, what is the seventh day? For me, I keep the Sabbath, the Saturday, is the seventh day of, of the week. That's my day, which I rest. Now, you will see also that, uh, uh, as I just said, six days shall you shall shall work be done. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest. A work convocation, you shall do no work on it. It shall be Sabbath for the Lord in all your dwellings. And it's on the seventh day, on that day, people should do acts of kindness, just like Jesus did. Acts of kindness. And that will rejuvenate us, rebuild us, refresh us. And when we start work on Monday, we are well, well, well refreshed. Next slide, please. And therefore, next slide, please. Are they all finished? Oh. Anyway, I just wanted to make the next one. The next one. It should be another one. Yes. Uh, just Revelation 14, verse 12. I like this verse. He says, he is a call for the endurance of the same. Those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. We are all hoping. We are all hoping to have eternal rest. And I just want our chorister to start with so just one verse. You know, that chorus, that chorus impresses me. It gives me hope that we're going to have eternal rest. And I've just demonstrated to you how useful resting at night how useful taking a vacation, how useful uh, uh, getting a recreation it is to our bodies. It reduces 
the incidence of cancers, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, and worst of all, the disease I told you of sour and sweetness. Just sing me that song and I'll end there. I don't know whether you know it, but my mother used to love this song, especially in chorus. Then only Rapa Jordani Take the hand and shake the hand of someone next to you, to the left, to the right, in front of you, behind you. Just welcome them to the house of the Lord. Yes, it's good to be here. The Lord has been good to us. He has given us yet another day to come together to worship Him in this place. I see our numbers continue to increase and I want to be faithful to the promise I gave yesterday. I said whoever is going to invite the highest number of people who are coming for the first time, I will have a gift. And I do have a gift, as I promised. Anyone who invited uh, people here who are here for the first time? Ten? Ten is too little? Should I start at twenty? <laughs> Anyone who invited um, eight? Eight who are here for the first time? Uh, six? Six? Five? Five, four, four. You invited four. You have seven. Um, um, I like this lady here. He, he, he just said to me that it's okay, I can give him his present tomorrow. <laughs> so my sister here, you invited four people. Are they here? Do you think they can raise up their hands to indicate? Is it okay? I know we're not at church. Is it okay to clap hands? We can clap hands. Let's clap hands for her. Yes, may the Lord bless you for the wonderful work you've done. And my brother, you're going to get us power negotiations. <laughs> you're going to get your present tomorrow as power negotiations. Um, we are continuing with our revival. This is day two, and uh, you don't want to miss out. We are here until Saturday, and the Lord is going to be blessing. You need to be at this coordinates, uh, geographic coordinates, because that's where the blessings will be flowing every night and the whole day on Saturday. Um, if you want to follow up on what is happening here, check out the website. There you will find the outlines for the sermons that we are presenting. You will be able to find details on the, on the crusade itself. You will be able to download a, a little poster you can send to your friend to invite them. Uh, if you've got questions, right there you can find us. We are on the social media, we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter. We are everywhere. You can find us anywhere. So you want to ask questions, you want to interact with us, Go to the uh, www.gospelrevival.org. 
and you will find all the details. We have got other devotionals to get encouragement during the day. We've got video clips of messages, particularly around family life. So go to our website, connect with us, ask us questions, and uh, we will always be there to respond and to connect with you. So let's get to our first part. You know, the time is a bit on, not on our side. We still need to do two things. So you'll bear with me. Maybe I need to steal a little bit of 15 minutes of your time to go home in order to address. We're starting with the first part, which is the family life marriage tune-up. We're just doing a little seminar uh, of 10 minutes or so. On Saturday, the whole day, we'll be focusing on families. So you don't want to miss out on Saturday. But during the week, we're going to give you just a little nuggets. Today, we're going to talk about effective parenting. Just a little part of effective parenting. That talks about practicing what you preach. Now, all parents who like their children to turn out to be good. The only challenge is that many of the parents don't practice what they preach. Many of the parents are like road signs. You know, you might have seen it. It might be a road sign somewhere. I can imagine which points, which direction to go to Blawayo or to Gweru. But the, the road sign has never been to Blawayo. It has always been staying there. But it keeps on pointing. That's the way to Blawayo. And that's what like many parents are. They're like road signs. They, are, they never get there. They just say, do that. They never practice what they preach. You, you, you might have seen them doing like this. You must never smoke. You must never. <laughs> they don't practice what they do. They are like road sign. They are pointing directions, but they themselves don't do what they preach. Now, children will never be shaped based on what we say. You see, they might not be good listeners, but they are good imitators. It's not so much what we say, it's what we do that is important to children. They want to imitate. They just want to be like their parents. So what you do, what you do from day to day, or how you practice, it's what you want to, they want to be. You know, I have two boys, one is 12, another one is 10, and, and you know, their mother would like to dress them up on, when we go to church with a tie on, and, and you see them holding their Bible and say that we are preachers who are like daddy. They, they, they just want to be like their parents. They want to behave like their parents. They want to do what their parents do. They want to imitate what we do. Even how I talk. You know, one of them thinks he's a preacher, even though he thinks he's a better preacher than me. They, 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 they behave in a way that they think their, their parents do. They want to imitate. Now, because parents are the children's greatest role model. And instruction to the children will only sink into their heads if it is backed up by character and consistent life. It is not so much what you say, it's how, what is your character and consistent life. You see, um, the unfortunate thing is that many of us as parents were hypocrites. We are not those who practice exactly what we preach and our lives are. If our goal is to have children who act and look and think and speak like Jesus, the method is for us to be like that. It's for us to be like Jesus so that they can see Jesus walking in the house and behaving and doing things in the house. They are looking at us. Children are observing everything we do. You know, in, in, my, in my home, you know, on Saturday night, they don't normally cook. They, they will get something out, maybe a little pizza, and then they come back and eat. One day I was not, I, I had to stay at another funeral service in the prayer evening. And I get home, and I find that there were boxes of pizza, but they were all empty. So, I said, oh, you finished the pizza? They said, yeah, we finished the pizza. So I said, okay, let me go and get more. So I went to the shop and came, I came back. When I came back, my daughter is 15 years old. She says, I saw that. So daddy, you practice what you preach. I said, what do you mean? I saw you. He said, I saw you. You were not angry or anything when we didn't leave some pizza for you. Right. So you practice what you preach. 
They are watching us. They are watching every detail. Particularly some of us who preach. And that's why many of them get discouraged. Because they see our lifestyle inconsistent. You see, the fact is we cannot impact that which you don't possess. If we want to change them, we need to possess it. Character is caught rather than taught. They catch it from your lifestyle, from your behavior, from your conduct. It's not so much what is taught. You can teach other things, but character is caught. And they want to catch it from you as you leave their life in front of them. They say an apple does not fall far from the tree. And there is truth in that. Parenting is not a to-do list. <coughs> you see, if your children do not somehow find the Lord and repent, your children will most likely to be like you or worse. Unto the third, fourth generation. This is what we call generational curses that follows them. So how you behave, that's what they will most probably be. If you beat your wife, they will probably beat their wives too. And their children will also beat their wives also because it's generations of them learning from one to another. And I was telling people the other day, I said, you know, my father was not the best of father, but he tried his best. I never saw him beat my, wife, my, my mother. Now, I never know what women are beaten for. <laughs> because he never taught me. So I, don't, I never know. I, I, I have no understanding. Maybe my wife has already done things to be beaten, but I don't know. <laughs> because I don't know why women are beaten and what things they must do to be beaten. Because he never taught me. And if one of my boys, I find that he's beating his wife, I'll go and beat the demon out of him. Where does he learn it from? We've got generations of not beating wives. Where will he be getting it from? He can't learn things from the street. And come and, but you see, they will become like you. You know, uh, you know many years ago when I was a student, I, I used to um, study during holidays. I used to stay in, in Soweto with my cousin. And my cousin was a you know, guys used to get drunk and come back and cause havoc in the house and you know, so on and so on. Now, his son, one day, his son was 12 at that time, and I remember the words. They, they stayed with me. The, the son said to me one day, when I grow up, I will not be a father like my father. That's what he said to me. And this was 20 years ago, yes, about 20 years ago, just over 20 years ago is when he told me this. Now, 20 years later, fast forward, he is a father like his father. The same thing that he said he will not do, that's what he has become. Because it goes from generations to generations. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Are you able to say to your children, I want you to be like me. Eat the way I eat. Drink the way I drink. Handle money the way I do. Treat me as I treat my parents. <laughs> if, you, if you've got uh, your own parents and you, you lock them out and you don't take care of them, your children are looking. When you get old, they will do the same to you. Forgive as I forgive. Live life as I live it. Are we able to say that? And if we are able to say that, then we are true parents. Teaching them to love. The question is that do you love your children? The question is yes, it's obvious. We love each other. But how do you show that you love your children? You love your children. We provide for them. We support them. We tell them we love them. But I want to tell you today, the greatest way to show that you love your children as parents is to love one another. That's the best way. When parents love one another, the children feel secure. They feel loved. They feel cared for. You know, they, they, they are excited when the parents exclude them and they're just in love. 
you know when I you know when I get home you know the children are, are excited you know my, my wife has taught them that when I come home you know they must run towards me you know to hug me you know so even though I've got a rough day and I feel like a nobody they, they make me feel special like a million dollars so they, they, they run towards me and, and, and they hug me and then my wife will come at the end and when she comes she finally hugs me while she's hugging me they're standing on the side and one group they're saying kiss kiss the other one says no kissing no kissing <laughs> and and when I eventually kiss my wife if it is a bit longer the daughter my eldest daughter she'll say oh no 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 parental guidance that's too much <laughs> um, but they just love it when they when their parents are in love they, they feel secure they feel safe and that's the best thing we can do to show that we love them <laughs> love one another stop this business of trying to buy your children by getting them this oh yeah i'm gonna do this your mother said and competing each other that's not it they, they are frustrated when the people who claim to love them they can't love each other so if you are not what you what you want your children to be if you are not the target the end result of what you want your children to be you must change and be what you want your children to be live as you want them to live you don't have to be perfect you just have to be a parent of integrity a parent of integrity is not a perfect parent you know we, we grew up in a time of parents who were perfect who who never made a mistake you know I oh, you know, when I was growing up, I was not that much naughty as I was the only son at home. So I was not as much naughty as I was expected to be. Now, so, so my little sister was a bit more naughty than me. Now, she used to do all kinds of things wrong. And I would be beaten every time for the things she do wrong. And then my mother would find out that it was not me. There was never, I'm sorry. I was just part of the casualty of the war of raising children. <laughs> it was just part of collateral damage. You know, they, they never cared. But you see, a, a parent of integrity is a parent who is not perfect, who makes mistakes. Because if you are perfect, you are setting up your children to failure. Because they will never be perfect. A parent of integrity is a parent who makes mistakes. But when he makes mistakes, he takes the opportunity to show the children how to fix the mistakes. There are some people today who are grown up who cannot say I'm sorry because they never heard their parents say I'm sorry. So when I as a parent have made a mistake and then I turn around and I said children I am sorry. They are teaching them, they are learning that you can be sorry, you can fix things when you have made a mistake. And that's what we are saying here. Amen. Amen. It's time to change gears now. I know we ran out of time, right? But it would be nice if we change gears to someone with a song, right? Ama yangu, kuna Jesu, kuna Jesu upone Zaka nyora mutamba, aleluya Kuti watarisa unopona Upe nyuti nopiwa, aleluya Upe nyusinga kumi Kutitika mutarisa, aleluya Jesu chete anoponesa Tarisa, upone, ama yangu Ama yangu, kuna Jesu, kuna Jesu, upone Zaka nyora mutamba, aleluya Kuti watarisa unopona Nino taura kuya kwangu, aleluya Kuna jesu na itwa mchene 
Tuende kutenda hizi rake haleluya Mweya wangu wakaponeswa Tarisa upone ama yangu Ama yangu kuna jesu kuna jesu upone Zaka nyora mutama haleluya Kuti watarisa unopona Tarisa upone ama yangu Ama yangu kuna jesu kuna jesu upone Zaka nyora mutama haleluya Kuti watarisa unopona to understand Shona to, to be blessed. It bypasses, it just gets to your soul and bless your soul. I am truly blessed. Our message today is entitled The Cosmic Conflict. The Cosmic Conflict. <coughs> cosmic Conflict. We, we will also put up the uh, tonight we will put up the outline and the verses that we are using on our website so uh, uh, for those who are not able to take notes cosmic conflict uh, the loving God created our world and after creating this world out of love he created man to live in joy and peace However, if we had to look at the state of our world today, we will realize that the world is in a difficult shape. The world is far from where God prepared it to be and planned it to be and purposed it to be. All over the world there is sickness, suffering and pain people who are struggling from day to day it does not matter any part of the world that you go you will find people who are suffering every day we hear of separation and divorce two people who who said they love each other so much just few months before or just few years before they now say we don't want each other we don't love each other and causing a lot of pain and heartache and headaches there is struggle and poverty and struggle to survive all over the world wherever you see you see many who are struggling then there is war and conflict that continues to rage on even as we speak then there are accidents and crimes even tonight Someone is going to get a message that their loved one has died in a car accident. This is the state of the world today. Then there are earthquakes and tsunamis that ravages the world that we find ourselves in. Then for many of us in the high profile category, then we've got our own baggage of challenges of stress and depression. Um which might even be tormenting or just as tormenting as the pain of suffering from those without. Then there is homelessness and despair. Little children looking up to God as if to ask God, what have we done to deserve a life like this? Then there is HIV AIDS ravaging the world and the offense that it leaves behind little children taking care of their own siblings. Then there is death and dying. Death which is reckless, which does not matter how poor you are. Even those who fail don't even have enough to bury their loved ones. And sometimes it is the, 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 the only child that they were hoping that will bring them out of poverty who end up dying. Death is reckless and cruel. That's the state of our world. And the question is why? Why 
are these things happening? Why do we have all of these things happening around us? Why? Why do we find the world in the state in which it is tonight? I would like to suggest that we are in the war. We are in the midst of a war, a cosmic conflict. These are all the casualties of the war that is raging on. The war between good and evil. And tonight the question is where did it start and what is going on? And that's why we go to the word of God. Isaiah 14, starting from verse 12 to 14. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. You have said in your heart, I will exalt, I will ascend in, unto the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the further side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. The Bible says Lucifer or Satan said in his heart, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Lucifer was an angel, a covering cherub, an angel closest to God. He had a privilege of being close to God until sin was found in his heart. He, he started talking within himself, talking to himself and in his own heart. That's why we say the heart is at the heart of the matter. It is what you think and purpose in your heart uh, that becomes and results into the actions that you do. So he started in his heart. That's why uh, the wise man says, watch your heart with all diligence. Because out of it comes the issues of life. What is going on in your heart? And, 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 and now Lucifer thought to himself and imagined this and he says, I will exalt my throne above the stars of heaven. I will sit upon the mount of congregation. I will sit just where God sit. I will sit at that very spot. That means I will move God aside and I will sit on that spot. I will be above him. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. God's presence was surrounded by clouds. And he says, I will go above the clouds. I will be above where you are, God. You will be below me. He says, I will be like the most high. I will be in your position. Just that I will put my position a little bit higher. You will be subservient to me. What we also find is that he wanted to build his throne above the stars of God. He wanted to sit where God sit. And he wanted to be like the most high. And I would like to suggest that this was the origin of sin. Or it defines what sin is. You see, sin is a rebellion against God. Sin is an attempt to be like God. Sin is an attempt to remove God in his throne and sitting on that throne. When you sin, you are saying, I want to build my throne above yours. You, are not, you have no right to be my God. I want to be God. That's what we do when we sin. In the sin, we are attempting to remove God from his throne and to sit on his throne. You see, when we commit sin, we're saying, God, you are not worthy to give us instruction because we are God ourselves. When you say, thou shalt not, we cannot obey you. When you, when you say you refuse, you are saying, God, I'm going to give instructions, not you. I don't take orders from you. Whenever one goes out of his way, whether he's committing adultery, you are saying, God, I don't obey you. I obey my feelings. My feelings are my God. When you tell a lie, you say, I don't obey you. I maneuver life myself. I don't care what you say. When you steal, you are saying, God, I provide for myself. I don't want you to provide for me. I am God. I am in charge. That's what we are saying when we sin. So even though Satan was created by God, he decided to rebel against God. He, he succeeded in convincing one third of the angels in heaven to join him 
in the toy toy against heaven. You can almost imagine them with the toy toy outside the throne of heaven. Right? Shouting their slogans. Uh, they, they, they started the rebellion against, against God. Now the Bible says in Revelation 12 verse 7 and to 9, it says, And war broke out in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angel fought. But they could not prevail, nor was, found, was their place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, the serpent of old called devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast out to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So there was a war in heaven. Michael, which is Jesus, and his angels, they, they fought against the dragon, Satan. And, and, and Satan could not prevail and now they were given an eviction order. They were kicked out of heaven. And they were kicked out to the earth. Now how did it come here? In Revelation 12 verse 12 it says, But woe unto the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you. He is filled with fury. He knows that his time is short. He knows his time is short because this whole revival we are saying Jesus is coming again. Because the devil's time is short. He knows his time is short. He wants to win as many people. So he was thrown out. And there was a warning to those who are on earth. So the first thing that Satan did was to go and tempt Adam and Eve at the Garden of Eden. That's what he did, the first thing. Now, Mrs. Adam, Sister Eve, she, 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 she is found close to the tree alone. Now, we don't know what she was doing next to the tree. But we know, maybe she was doubting whether if I eat of the tree, I will really die. You know, the Bible says each one of us is tempted when we are drawn our way by our own lust and enticed. We were tempted. You see, the, the temptation is not so much about the temptation. It's what the temptation finds in you. Whatever your mind has been thinking, whatever your imagination has been, the, the devil doesn't know what is in your mind. So you keep on pressing the button to see if you're going to move in and you keep on pressing the next one. Whatever you have been having, the devil knows. He will keep on trying this. And if you see, oh, you've got weakness with the sisters, he, he, he will bring more. If, if, if your weakness is money, you will bring more opportunities. So, so, so we are, it is what is inside of us that leads us to be tempted. Now, she's standing there by the tree. Or maybe she was just trying to organize a fruit salad to surprise Adam <laughs> from the time when he comes back to so give him some nice, or she was wanted to prepare jam or something, whatever it was. No, no, no. Satan comes in the form of disguise. He doesn't come straight. He comes in the form of a serpent. Now you can understand why he chose the serpent. The Bible says of all the beasts in, in, in Genesis 3 verse 1, of all the beasts that God has created, there was none that was as cunning as the serpent. That means it was straight wise. It knew what was happening. If you want to know what has happened in the Garden of Eden, you need to talk to the serpent. The serpent will tell you that uh, the elephant is organizing a party and the lions are not invited and then there is uh, something <laughs> happening. And, and, you know, if, if, if you want to know, he, he, he was down. He, he, he knew what was happening. He, 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 this was a serpent. He, he, he was connected. He was there on Facebook. He was there on Twitter. He was, he, he was everywhere. He knew what was there in the social media. He, he knew. He was, he was operating everywhere. So that's why Satan came in a form of a serpent. And I would like to tell you tonight that the devil has not changed the strategy. He still comes under disguise. The devil never comes straight. He never comes up and he says, Now, um, I'm Satan. Other call me the devil. And I used to be called Lucifer. I've come in to tempt you. Uh, are you ready? <laughs> 
He never comes directly. He always comes under disguise. He, he comes in the people that you least expect. He always comes under disguise. You know, for young ladies, he always comes under disguise. He comes in the form of nice looking gentleman who drives nice German cars. There might even be those that have nothing on the top. And he says, baby, would you want to go for a ride? You don't know that the ride goes all the way to hell. He always comes under disguise. Right? If, if, you, if he wants to tempt men, he, he comes in the form of young women who have got a shortage of clothing material. They paid the same price for a short material, which they could have bought for a longer one without a discount. Now, it, it, they always come. <laughs> he never comes directly. He comes under disguise. If he wants people to believe in witchcraft, you know, he starts by throwing a dead snake, then a dead bed, then he sends an aunt to come and explain us, oh no, these are the things of the people. Yeah, yeah. no, this is, you know, even your church will not help you. He always comes. He never comes straight. Comes under disguise. That's why the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. Yes. You need to always be sober. Have your eyes open. So, so he comes up to Eve. He, he comes up to Eve and he, he's under disguise. No, no, no. Uh, you know, before you condemn me, but the one inspired writer, she says that he came with flattery. He came with flattery to Eve. No, no, no. So, 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 so don't think the preacher is offline because my imagination is that when, when he got to Eve, he stood there and he says, Eve, babe, wow. You look just fine. You're the most beautiful creature I've ever seen. Now, God really took time on you, baby. <laughs> and then Eve gets impressed. He says, oh, really, Satan? Oh. Thank you. You know, he's flattering her, and she, 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 she's like now all kind of excited. And, uh, you know, the, 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 then he gets to the business. Well, now she's getting impressed. He, he gets to the business, and he says, Did God say you must not eat any of the tree in the garden? Now, you can see what he's trying to do. He's putting on the defense, he wants to make God to look bad. He still does that to young people. Does your church say you must not even kiss or hold hands? They want to put you on defense. So that you can say, oh no. So, so, so Eve is put on defense. Now no, she, she, you know, Eve is now on defense. She says, no, 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 Satan. Ah, no, no, God is not too bad. You know, I don't know. He said, whenever we want to make fruit salad or we want to make jam, we can use any of the tree in the garden, oh, but there is a tree in the center of the garden that we are not supposed to touch. And I mean, the, the touching part was not there because Eve was like these sisters who didn't read the Bible. But anyway, let's leave it alone. <laughs> So she has her own things there because she never read the Bible. So she says, uh, it says we must not touch or eat it and, and the day we touch it and eat it we shall surely die. No, 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 no. Then, 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 then the serpent says, no, no, no. Eve, Eve. <laughs> Eve, no, no. You know me. You know I come from upstairs there where the big man is. She says, oh, really? Oh, that's so cool. You know, um, I wish I could go there. Oh, I still have connections. I can see what I can do. But 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 if 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 come on here come on here um uh, this thing of you dying nah 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 the 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 the, the old man doesn't mean it it's just it's just the scare tactics because he knows on the day that you will eat you will be wise you will be like God now you see. This is, this is the point. You see, he was kicked out of heaven because he wanted to be like God. So he says to Eve, disobey God, you will be like God. That's the point I was telling you. That sin is an attempt to be God. He says, disobey him. Now you become God, you'll be like him. You give instructions, don't take instructions. He says, forget 
forget about it. Now Eve l- fell into it. You know? He fell into the st- into the story, into the thing. He says God knows your eyes will be open, you will be like him. They fell into it. Listen to verse 6 and this is very interesting. Before we continue verse 6, it says, now the Satan has done the temptation and is finished. Then it says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Now, after the temptation is over, she makes up her own mind. You can never blame a temptation for falling. After the temptation is done, you need to make up your own mind. So she makes up her own mind. She says, the tree is good for food. Pleasant to the eyes. And desirable to make one wise. If we look at all our sins, they either fall on the three things. The food, the stomach. The eyes. What is attractive to the eyes? And to look to be smart. Almost all our sins, they fall under those categories. She looks into it and she, she makes up her mind. She says, no, 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 it's good for food, pleasant to the eyes. Uh, and then she ate. She ate. She made the decision. And then the Bible says she gave her husband also and he ate. And now, I mean, I don't know what kind of a husband Adam was. Like, it was like these fathers who are like, these men who are, who are like, they have star soft, you know, who are just flexible. He doesn't even wait to be tempted. He just says, ah, I'm, ah, my wife, you've eaten. Ah, let me eat also. Ah, that, let me just eat. He, I, he, he, he's like a spaghetti husband. I mean, I don't know what's wrong with Adam. He's just flexible. I mean, he, he was supposed to be the man. He's supposed to say, hey, 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 hey you, what, what have you done? He, God has given him, I said, ah, no, my wife, ah, you are so beautiful. Ah, if we die, we're going to die together. Ah. <laughs> Ah, ah, I'm not staying alone ah, with the elephants. Ah, thank you. <laughs> now this brought the, sea, the, 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 the cosmic conflict. This is how sin entered our world. And because of that, this war has been raging on for 6,000 years. This war between good and evil. Uh, the battle has been raging on for 6,000 years. The devil has been uh, depressing and distressing people. For 6,000 years he has been uh, killing people, causing accidents and incidents that hurt their lives. For 6,000 years he has been infecting them with incurable diseases. Uh, for 6,000 years he has been breaking their hearts and causing them heartaches and headaches. For 6,000 years he has been killing and destroying people. For 6,000 years. The devil has been harassing God's people for 6,000 years. Every decision that we make is made in the context of the God controversy. Even when we're sitting here, there are two forces. There's a force of good that says you must do right. There's another force that says, ah, nah, don't take it too serious. There is no one neutral. It's either you're working for one side, to the Lord's side, or you're working against the Lord. No one is neutral. And the climax of the controversy is when Jesus was born. When Jesus came down, that was the climax of the controversy. When the little baby was born in Bethlehem. After Jesus was born, he moved around opening the eyes of the blind. Now, cleaning the leper, healing the sick, feeding the hungry, raising the dead. When the devil saw all of this, he was upset. Because the devil wants people to be sick. He wants people to die. So Jesus was, was reckless. He was raising up, healing the people. And the devil was upset because he wants them to have pain. He wants them to have heartaches. He, 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 he was angry. Even though sometimes the devil said, I'm going to kill them before Jesus arrives. But when Jesus comes, he raised them again. The devil got frustrated. He got angry with, with Satan, with, with, with Jesus. He decided that Jesus must be stopped and he must be stopped. He tried to discredit him. He said, now he is with publicans and sinners. It didn't work. They say he break the Sabbath. It didn't work. He tried to discredit him in the way that he can, but it never worked. <coughs> Finally, he decided that Jesus must be killed. He says he must be killed, but his, his death will not be in secret. We'll make it public. We're going to make it the worst kind of death, such that even his disciples, when they look at his death, 
they will never want to follow him because we're, we're going to make it we're going to make it on the weekend when everybody is in Jerusalem uh, we're gonna, but during Passover we're going to make sure that it's a publicity stunt to say we're going to destroy him we're going to make sure that and we're going to hang him on the cross naked without clothes on we're going to humiliate him we're going to embarrass him because the Bible itself says cursed be the one who hangs on the cross we're going to make sure that by the time we're done with Jesus Christianity will be dead so he planned it. He, he used one of, one of his friends, Judas, to betray him. Somebody close to him. They came at night and, and they carried him from Gethsemane. And the whole night they interrogated him. They harassed him. Then the next day they took him to Pilate's court. There they put a crown of thorns on his head. No, no, no. To, to, to make sure that the crown does not fall, they, they, they sink it into the skull. Uh, causing the blood to flow. They beat him up until his back was like raw meat. He bled because of us. Eventually they put a heavy cross on him to lead him all the way to Calvary. And at Calvary when they reached there they put those nails on his hands tearing off the veins on his hands as they nailed him. And eventually they threw that cross into the hole, tearing off the hands while he was there on the cross. Jesus eventually died on the cross, dying for our sins. As we conclude, an, an allegory is told, a story is told about you know and allegory is one of those stories they they didn't really happen before you judge me but they illustrate a point it says after jesus was buried on that friday afternoon the devil left his angels around the grave to to watch over the grave to make sure he doesn't rise rise again and late on and on that saturday and friday evening the devil called on on his mobile. He called on to some of the 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 the, the, the guys that he has stationed on the side on, on, on the on, on the graveyard, and he, and they said, "Do you still have him?" And then the guys responded. They said, "No, no, no. We still have him. He, he's here. He, he's not going anywhere." Sunday, Saturday morning, he again he was restless. Early in the morning, he called again. He says. Is he still dead? Is he still on the grave? They said, yeah, go and have your good time, Satan. He's still dead. He's going nowhere. That Saturday afternoon again, he calls. He's, he's worried. Do you still have him? He said, no. Why? Go on with your party. He's going nowhere. Even if he resurrects, we'll kill him again. <laughs> there is no way. We, we have got enough army here to sort him out. If he comes up. And then... Saturday evening, the same thing. We still have him. And then early on Sunday morning, early on Sunday morning, the, the, the devil calls. Do you still have him? The, 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 the angel says, we, we, we can explain. <laughs> oh, we, we, we can explain. An angel came from heaven. And as he was coming down, he was so fast he forgot to break. He hit the earth and there was an earthquake. Uh, and, and we were thrown off like dead men. Oh, uh, and as he came down, he had so much power, so much majesty, he, he went down to the grave and he rolled away the, the stone and he said to Jesus, come out, your father is calling you. And, and Jesus came out and, and he marched out of the grave. Oh, Satan, we couldn't help it. He had so much power. He had so much, after he took some few steps, he looked back and he says, oh, grave, where is thy victory? Oh, death, where is thy sting? And as he marched forward, he had keys on his head. He says, I have got the keys of hell and hates. We couldn't stop him. We couldn't stop him. We are sorry. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. And because he lives, there is hope for tomorrow. Because he lives, there is victory today. Because he lives, I am more than a conqueror. Because he lives. I'm a child of the king because he lives. 
He conquered for us. He conquered for us. He did it for us. I don't want to labor you, but there's a little story that happened in Chicago. This is a true story. As we conclude, the, the story is told of a big gathering that happens every year at the University of Chicago, a gathering of all Baptists around Chicago. They, 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 they gather there, and uh, on this particular year, they, they spend the whole day there, and they come with their food packages to eat as they spend the whole day there. And then on this particular day, there was Dr. Tillich. Dr. Tillich came to be the guest speaker. Dr. Tillich preached for two hours. And as he preached for two hours, he produces quoting books and scholars proving that Jesus never rose from the grave. And because Jesus never rose from the grave, Christianity is a waste of time. It's just a social gathering, a nice thing to hang around with. And he quoted other scholars and other books supporting his arguments. And when he has finished, it was time for question. There was an old man at the back, an old preacher at the back of the hall. They pointed at him and he, he stood up and he says, Dr. Tillich, uh, I'm just an ordinary man. Uh, I have not been to the universities that you have been to. Uh, I have not studied where you have studied. At this time he went to his little bag and he, he took out an apple. And he started munching. He says, I, I, have, I don't know the scholars that you quoted today. Munch, munch. I, I, I don't have the degrees that you have. Munch, munch. I'm just an ordinary preacher. Munch, munch. But I have got one question. Munch, munch. At this time he had finished the apple. He put the cock back into the bag. I said, I've got one question for you. And the question that I have is that the apple that I have just eaten, was it sweet or was it sour? <laughs> Dr. Tillich in his own scholarly way stood up and he says, well, I cannot be expected to know how the apple tasted because I never tasted it. And the old man stood up and said, that's my point. That's my point. You have never tasted my Jesus. You have never tasted my Jesus. If you have tasted my Jesus, you know that he lives. For he lives within me. He walks with me. He talks with me. And for all my journey, Jesus is by my side. You can criticize him, but you have never tasted my Jesus. When you have tasted my Jesus, you will know how he's the king of kings. You will know how he's the Lord of lords. Because he has come through for me. I have seen miracles. You have never tasted him. Amen. When you have tasted him, you will know what he can do for you. Amen. You see, Christianity is not a theoretical thing. Amen. It's something of experience. Yes. I can spend the whole night talking about salvation, but it will not make sense. You need to experience it yourself. Yes. You need to taste it. You will know that he is real. For he is real in my soul. Amen. So tonight... You want to taste Jesus. You want to experience him. You don't want to talk about him or just hear about him. He says, I want to experience you. I want to experience. I want to feel that he lives indeed. To give me victory through the cosmic conflict. Through the trials and the challenges of life. He's there. And he wants to come into your heart. To empower you. To make you live right. If it's your wish today to say, I want Jesus to live within me. I want to taste Jesus. I want to experience Jesus in my life. If you want to experience Jesus in your life, I'll ask you to stand as we pray together. All of us who says, I want to experience Jesus in my life. I'll ask you to stand as we pray together. You want to experience Jesus in your life as we pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful. We're grateful for speaking to us in the way you've done today. We're grateful for your love and mercy upon us. We're grateful for bringing us here today 
to hear your word. Here we are standing to say we want to experience you. We want to taste you. In our lives. Do it for us today. Come into our hearts. Give us the joy of salvation. That we can know how sweet it is to trust in you. To know that every day with Jesus is better and sweeter than the day before. Give us that experience in our walk today. Some of us have been church members. Some of us have not been, but all of us, Lord, just give us the experience of you. Do it for us today. Do it to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In my voice I shall shout as I cross to yonder shore.
Desert Media Center, evangelizing through media.